Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian at the 8th Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada. And we have with us uh, a rare treat, somebody who came from literally halfway around the world for the conference, uh, retired vice, uh, Japanese uh, Vice Admiral Yoji Koda, who you were the Commander-in-Chief for the Japanese fleet. Sir, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I really enjoy the, the conference. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. You know, most of the participants here, I mean, obviously there's participation from 70 countries. There are representatives from South Korea. There's a very large uh, Japanese uh, 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 group here. Yeah. Why is this conference important to you? You know, why have you taken so much time and traveled so far and, and the Japanese delegation traveled so far to okay. attend? Yeah, you know, uh, of course, our main focus is security. But uh, today, world affairs are so closely interrelated. So. If we do not really understand the, what, what's happening in Europe, perhaps our decision will be not so ideal. So, especially for develop a better future idea, we need to understand the, the European view or North American view. So that's why we are here. Yeah. Um, we talked on the plane. Uh, one of the things also was obviously there's a change in government now in the United States. Looks like you know it is, doesn't look like Donald Trump is going to be the 45th president of the United States. Um, you know, th and there was some concern. Uh, I think in the reporting in Japan, there was a sense even in, in Japan that Clinton was likely going to be the winner of it. I think that it was a surprise that Trump won. How is the Trump victory being regarded in Japan? Oh, no, of course. Uh, um, to be honest with you, that that's a big surprise, and also uh, something unthinkable happened for the, most of the Japanese and Japanese media, and especially Japanese media. You know, the, they really wanted the, the Ms. Clinton would be the president. So, but what really happened was totally opposite. So, psychologically, Japanese people and media are not so well prepared. And that, that's, I think, the current situation in Japan, yeah. Um, Shinzo Abe, Japanese Prime Minister, uh, visited New York. He was on his way to Peru for an economic conference, but he stopped by and met with the president-elect, yeah. which was seen as a dramatic gesture. Yeah. Um, you uh, speak to still top circles uh, in the government. What was the feedback from that meeting between uh, Prime Minister Abe and the president-elect? Oh, you know, the, uh, one of the problems before the election was the, J the Japanese government did not have the close relationship, the ties with the, the Mr. Trump. So Abe tried to fill the, that gap you know, as soon as possible. And he made the first phone call and he, you know, they get an, he got an arrangement with uh, Mr. Trump as the first Western leaders. You know. So I think Abe, Abe's tactics at least went pretty well. Yeah. Do you... Um from the standpoint of what should be next from the administration, from, from the new administration, from a Japanese perspective, what are some of the things that Japan would like to see from the United States at a time when China is becoming increasingly belligerent, is building the three islands in the region, increasingly contesting uh, and getting into confrontations, including with Japanese Coast Guard, but as well occasionally with naval vessels? Oh, yeah. The, during the presidential election campaign, you know, the, I think the Mr. Uh, Trump's, you know, the uh, message to Japan was a little too extreme. So that generates some serious concern ab among the Japanese leadership and also peoples. So first thing the Trump's administration have to do has to do is a you know to explain their real thought and. Hopefully, there would be no substantial jump changes in the U.S. policy toward Asia. And of course, the, we are facing almost day-by-day day Chinese assertive actions. So that's something the, the U.S. at least maintain the current policy and maneuvers. And if there will be some sub substantial changes, of course, the two governments has, have to and coordinate very well. But I think that will go smooth, yeah. 
You've uh, devoted your entire life to Japan's national security, mm. uh, all the way from 1972 when you joined the Navy. You were in the United States for many years. Uh, you did the Grand Slam in terms of driving every road in America. The Admiral's really, really cool. He's driven every. He knows more about the United States than literally anybody watching this uh, this video. Uh, but wh what I wanted to ask you is, you have a front row seat on what's been going on with China. China's growth over the decades in terms of its capability. How has China's capabilities changed even in the last decade? And what do you want people in Washington Washington and American national security circles to know about how China's behavior has changed. Okay, the, uh, it's safe to say that from mid 1990s, you now that's the time when China really started developing the good military from the lens of the Western military, and so far, you know, the it, Chinese air force and navy, their capabilities are getting better and better and something pretty close to ours. But at, at the same time, China has some problems, you know. For example, the today's modern equipment, basically they are the copies of the US equipment. So looks good, for example, Chinese Aegis or cruise missiles. But the real capability is really unknown. And also the training and the doctrines. So, we are watching very carefully, but at least one, one thing very true is Chinese military is getting better and better and they are learning very quickly, so they will catch up, especially in terms of the quality. And but at the same time, one thing we have to be very careful and I, one thing I really want the Washington DC to understand is China has three standards. When they talk to the Americans, basically they are very, very sincere and honest. And when they try to speak to Japan, Japanese or Japan, they try to ignore by humiliation. Ignore Japan by humiliation. And, but when they talk to the ASEAN nations or ASEAN nations, you know, they try to bully them, these nations, using their power as the, 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 the support. So American, especially Washington DC, has to understand Chinese three standards. So especially, I want the, Amer the Washington DC to listen to very carefully when they speak to the ASEAN nations, because basically they're arrogant and single-sided and self-rightness. And if the Washington DC fail to understand that part, they only listen to the Chinese story from the Beijing US point of view. You know? China is pretty honest, but behind that, China is doing a lot of you know the assertive things to the Japan and Asia, especially Asian nations. And those Asian nations are the nations that really needs the U.S. help. So in order for the U.S. to really maneuver well to cope with China, that's the voice, and that's the thing the Washington needs to understand. What are the Russian capabilities that you've watched develop? that are the most worrying to you? Is it something like the DF-21D uh, missile? Is it the DF-26? What are the systems that you, mean, as a senior commander, worry you? Russia, Russia ch ch Chinese. Uh, uh, Chinese. Okay. Yeah, uh, of course, the anti-ship ballistic missile could be the game changer. But uh, still, their final per performance is not yet, you know, the the confirmed, and also, if U.S. and Japan really they take advantage of the joint effort in our BMD, not not uh, anti-ship ballistic missile, but uh, ballistic missile defense, there are a lot of uh, the areas for us to apply to develop our capability against Chinese anti-ship uh, ballistic missile. So there are a lot of things for US and Japan to do, but at least one thing really needed is the our capa new capability. That is, no, of course, today untouched. Right. But new capability to really, I would say, neutralize Chinese attempt to kill the US carriers. And, and one of the things you said is that it's also very easy from your standpoint to turn the tables on the Chinese and to put pressure on them, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. you, know, you said that their strategy actually creates weaknesses that you can exploit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you know the China has its own the Achilles heels, and so 
U.S. and Japan also should develop new strategy and tactics uh, that really focus on the Chinese Achilles heels. For example, the, in Cold War days, Far East Soviet did not depend anything on this, their stocks, sea lines of communications. But today, China depends so much on the sea trade. So th th that's part of the Chinese Achilles heels or technological disadvantages. So if US and Japan coordinate very well and develop the common strategy and tactics and prepare our, our, ourselves for the future Chinese maneuver and actions, I think we will be okay. Obviously the Chinese have been on a massive charm offensive with the Philippines. Uh, uh, Duterte has said some very, very negative uh, things about the United States. I want the United States and all foreigners out of my bases, for example. That uh, relationship was something very important for the administration as part of the pivot yep. to get U.S. forces to be deployed through Philippine air bases and naval bases, as well as also some, some ground troops. The Philippine, uh, Philippine Coast Guard has benefited enormously from training from the Japanese. Uh, Japan has been very generous with, with the Philippines. Are you concerned that the Philippines will flip and what are the strategic implications of having Duterte kicking everybody out of the country? Okay, the, if we take a look at the, that area, a little the wider view, the South China Sea is surrounded by the, a lot of islands, starting from Taiwan, Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore, Malaysia, and then Vietnam. So keeping the Taiwan and Philippines in our side will be the key for the future success. So by all means, especially from the political and di diplomatic efforts, you know, we have to keep the, the Philippines in our side. And especially from the President Duterte's point of view, he's doing a lot of domestic things. So of course, it's not extreme uh, ideal, but Duterte's focus is to treat the in-country's cancer as soon as possible. So he's doing uh, some extreme things, uh, ignoring the human rights. So that generates the kind of the confrontation between US and, and the US and the Filipino. But uh, if the Philippines and US understand the, the real security common objective, that's China. So of course, the keeping the negotiation with the human rights is one thing. Of course, we should not stop. But at the same time, U.S. and Filipinos should discuss more closely with the security side, especially the, the South China Sea issue. And the, that's the way to convince the Filipino leadership, Duterte, and the Filipino people to stay in our side. So my, point to the, my comment to the Washington, D.C. is the human right is not the single issue. There are one another thing. That's the security in South China Sea and larger strategy toward China. So keep Philippines in our side. Uh, but at the same time, we need to discuss the human rights thing as a separate issue. But that's important. But Duterte needs to, some, to do some surgery because that, you know, the really drug issue is the cancer of the, the Philippines. So he's doing a right thing, yeah. In, in that sense. In that sense. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the islands, and I know you have to go, so I have two quick questions. Question number one is, how seriously do, do the island, the uh, three islands that China is building in the South China Sea affect the strategic dynamic in that region? Yeah, and that, you know, the, so far, the, China claims many things. But physically, they cannot send, for example, the fighter jet, because there is no airfield in the southern part of Spratlys. But now almost three islands with the airstrip are ready for use. So if China started sending the fighters and the maritime patrol aircraft, U.S. maneuver in the South China Sea or the U.S. Uh, I'd say presence in the South China Sea is under the very severe or precise Chinese surveillance. And sometimes they try to make some willful approaches. So that, you know, the 180 degrees difference, because so far US, US is free to be there and free to maneuver. But now China will always send aircraft and ships to follow our ship, uh, US or Japanese maneuvers. 
So you know, the, the, that's the fundamental changes, and that increases the uh, kind of the unintended, you know, the the encounters. Yeah. Last question. Um, recently, United States, Japan, and United Kingdom signed a trilateral strategic cooperation agreement. For many, that was seen as a very surprising thing, where a leading world power and European power is joining the United States and Japan. How important is that deal for regional security? You know, the uh, one of the things that frustrates Japan or U.S. is we are really fighting the vocal war, war with the fierce bullet of the wording with China. And so far, very few support from the Europe or NATO countries. Basically, they are out of the, the region nations and their relationship with China is more on the economy and trade. I understand the reason. But say British involvement or UK's involvement, involvement in the, our area, of course, we do not want the physical military presence but at least politically or psychologically, the Brit Br Brits as the, the, the nation with the common interest, that's the free use of sea. So that is a very encouraging signal. And for Beijing, perhaps the British participation in our group is the another signal, you know, the maybe yellow to red signal, wait a minute. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, is welcome, yeah. Now, now that you said that, I have to ask you one more question. Do, does NATO, does there need, in the event that Article 5 is triggered, let's say China, for example, attacks Japan, United States would get pulled into that conflict, in which case NATO could, you know, you could have an Article 5 declaration and a lot of NATO countries that don't spend a lot of time thinking about Asia may be involved. Is it time for Japan, countries in the region, as well as European leaders, military leaders, mm. to hold war games and exercises together to get a better idea of how something like this might happen in a worst case to get ready for the future. Yeah, that could be a good idea, but you know, your question really brings my answer back to the first question. Because say, in Europe, still the Syria, uh, Europe and Middle East, Syria and Ukraine are the big issues. So for the United States, the, you know, the, as a world power, only single world power, you has U.S. has to be involved in two things, two theaters. So really, uh, you know, in order for the U.S. to develop the best strategy and tactics to be involved in two, you know, the confrontation, really, yes, the war gaming is very important, and also the future conflict, two stage, uh, two fronts conflict, one in Europe and one in Japan, not specific to the current situations. Yeah. Um, Last question, because every time I talk to you, I come away with so many things I want to talk to you about, and I only see you when you come over, uh, come over here. I haven't been lucky enough to see you in Japan yet. L really, my last question. You know, in the environmental panel, which was the last one, you mentioned the reality that climate change is a reality, and that it's going to cause mass human migrations as islands disappear in that region, causing human migration, and you also said could cause some serious regional instability that China could capitalize on. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, the, today I think the China is already ad advancing into the Pacific Islands uh, by money. And I think among 14 nations, I think eight nations are already favorable to China and six nations are favorable to Taiwan. So, you know, for China, especially the practical, con not full control, but even the partial control, but say showing their foot footprint in any part of the Pacific will be very important especially when they take the United States in into account so China is already doing and if we we means the US Japan Australia and Canada we fail to really manage those sinking island issues maybe China may take advantage of our you know the uh, uh, disorganized policies so my point is do not present any gift as a, you know, the, our vacancy right. for the Chinese opportunity. So US, Japan, Canada, and Australia, we need to do some things to really help those nations, sinking nations, and improve the situations, yeah. Sir, Admiral Koda, thank you very much, as always, arigato gozaimasu. Oh, it's my pleasure, thank you, I enjoyed, yep. <laughs>